Welcome to Missing the Mark, where we look for meaning in strange places. I'm Christopher. This video is intended primarily for younger men who like Dr. Jordan Peterson and who will naturally imitate his conversational style, quite possibly without consciously intending to. The problem with being young and inexperienced is that it's harder to know how to adapt what you see to your own personality and circumstances. This video will hopefully give people a start and help them to avoid some pitfalls. Dr. Peterson can, when he wants to, be very dominant in a conversation. I'm going to play a clip from an interview he did, and we're going to take a look at how he accomplishes this. I'll link the full interview in the description. Uh, though, please note, it was obviously edited, so you do have to be suspicious of it as presented. Here's a question. Can men and women work together in the workplace? Yes, I, how I do, you do it. How do you know? Because I work with a, a lot of women. Right. Well, it's been happening for, what, 40 years? And, and things are deteriorating very rapidly at the moment in terms of the relationships between men and women. And you Is there sexual what, harassment in the workplace? Yes. Should it stop? That'd be good. Will it? Well, not at the moment it won't because we don't know what the rules are. Do you think men and women can work in the workplace together? I don't know. Without sexual harassment? We'll see. We'll see. How many years will it take for men and women working in the workplace together? More than 40. To get a sense. We don't know what the rules are. Like, what? here's a rule. Don't, don't How about you... no makeup in the workplace? Why would that be a rule? <laughs> Why should you wear makeup in the workplace? Uh, Isn't that sexually provocative? No. It's not? No. Well, what is it then? What's the purpose of makeup? Some people would like to just put on makeup. Why? To, <laughs> to, I don't know why Why do you make your lips red? Because they turn red during sexual arousal. That's why. Why do you put rouge on your cheeks? Same reason. I mean, look. How about high heels? The conversation goes on, but I think it is quite sufficient to see what Dr. Peterson is doing that establishes dominance in the conversation. However, before we get to what Dr. Peterson is doing, I want to address something superficial, which is probably misleading. At least as the video is cut, Dr. Peterson interrupts the person he's talking to more than once. The interrupting, on its own, does nothing to make Dr. Peterson dominant. I mention this because interrupting is easy if you don't know how and when to do it. But to explain how he makes it work, I have to first explain what he's doing. The most important thing, though it will be the most dispiriting thing for younger people, is that he has a command of facts coupled with a thorough understanding of the subject he is discussing. I should note that I do not mean to say that Dr. Peterson is an expert, or necessarily even perfectly correct, only that he has thought the subject out and is aware of the weaknesses, as well as the strengths, of his own position and those of the position he's attacking. This is why he's able to answer both his opponent's questions and his own. His opponent will naturally attack the position at its weakest places, but, knowing what they are, he knows how to respond to attacks against them. This means that his opponent cannot shake him. He has already asked himself the tough questions, so he's at no disadvantage when someone else asks him the same tough questions. This is half of establishing dominance. The other half is knowing his opponent's strengths and weaknesses. I'm not just talking about the strengths and weaknesses of one position his opponent holds, but of all the positions his opponent holds. The trick to his establishing dominance, then, is to play his opponent's positions against each other. The ideal attack is to attack one position in a way that would require him to sacrifice a more important position to protect. To look at our particular example, Dr. Peterson is attacking the idea that sexual harassment can be eliminated through nagging. Not that his opponent phrased it that way, but it's what his position amounts to, that one can eliminate all sexual elements from the workplace by telling males to stop viewing females in sexual ways. Dr. Peterson then pointed out that many women do things in the workplace which encourage men to view them in sexual ways. But if he had phrased this generally, or given an example such as flirting, his opponent could have responded that such things should be handled on an individual basis, but in any event presuppose consent to the interaction. Flirting with someone does imply that you want them to flirt back. And had he done this, Dr. Peterson would not have held any sort of dominant position because the argument would simply have gone back and forth, with each side making an at least decent point. Instead, Dr. Peterson chose an example which would have required his opponent to sacrifice something dearer to him license to behave with only the mildest of restraint. Progressives are libertines at heart, at least where it concerns themselves. To suggest that a person should exercise restraint on their own behavior, because of how others will react to it, is anathema to a progressive. 
at least when it comes to sexual matters. So Dr. Peterson's opponent is stuck. He cannot say that sexualizing behaviors, like wearing makeup and high heels, constitute consent to be flirted with, since they are not targeted behaviors, and thus obviously don't. He also cannot say that women should keep sexualizing behavior out of the workplace, because to do so is anathema to a progressive. His only option would be to contest that makeup and high heels are in any way sexualizing, but this is a non-starter. Both things are far too associated with women trying to maximize their sexual appeal for this to be a viable option. Dr. Peterson's opponent would simply come off as dishonest if he tried this. There is another option that Dr. Peterson's opponent could try, but this is foreclosed to him by another progressive dogma. He could say that while makeup and high heels are sexualizing, their primary use within the workplace is actually intrafemale status competition. It just so happens that intrafemale status competition has, as one of its more powerful weapons, sex appeal. Thus, the high heels and makeup, and one could throw in waist-hugging jackets and low-cut shirts as well, are not intended to have any sexual significance within the workplace, and should generally be understood that way. They should be understood to be the same sort of thing as a man wearing a $50,000 watch, or a suit made from the undercoat of an endangered Tibetan wild ox, which is collected by the Dalai Lama once every seven years in a special ceremony where they read it poetry to hypnotize it. Their only significance is that the person wearing them is important. But this response is not open to a progressive, because it places women in a negative light, since status competition is a bit mean-spirited and not at all humble. And placing women in a negative light, whether true or not, is another thing which is anathema to a progressive, especially when it's a man doing it. All of which Dr. Peterson almost certainly knew. And it is this comprehensive knowledge which was the key to his dominance. By giving his opponents questions which his opponent couldn't answer, he placed himself in control. And this is the context for Dr. Peterson interrupting. He only interrupted when his opponent didn't have anything to say and was just filling space, stalling in the hope that something would come to him. By contrast, had Dr. Peterson interrupted what sounded like the start of a substantive response, instead of sounding in command, he'd have come off as being too scared to let his opponent respond. That is to say, the interrupting would have had precisely the opposite effect to what it did. This is the main way in which Dr. Peterson dominated the conversation. The other is more complicated, but boils down to refusing to accept the framing which his opponent proposed. You can see that when he said, is there about, sexual well, harassment in the workplace? Yes. Should it stop? That'd be good. Will it? Well, not at the moment, it won't. He turns the question from one of whether sexual harassment is acceptable, the question his opponent would like to discuss because he's on firm ground there, if he can get someone to take up a contrary position, into whether it is controllable. This was a good move for the reasons discussed above, but it also served to establish dominance as the conversation proceeded to be about what he wanted it to be about. But again, I should note that he didn't do it by sheer force of personality. He knew what his opponent wanted to discuss, and shut that down by agreeing with his opponent before his opponent could disagree with him about it. That was the function of, should it stop? That'd be good. I hope that this was helpful in showing how it is that Dr. Peterson is able to dominate arguments and how one can imitate this quality of his in a way that can be adapted to other people. Equally, I hope that it helped to clarify what shortcuts to not take. Until next time, may you hit everything you aim at.